We welcome you to the Tate Ministry of Denton Bible Church. The speaker today is the senior pastor, Tom Nelson. Well, if you are here with us for the first time, you stepped in in the middle of a series. That's why everything's darkened up on this stage, so we can see that, um, that screen on some different things. We're taking a look at uh, an overview of the history of the Christian church. And this week, we're going to be getting down to where a lot of us can remember. A lot of us uh, we will touch our roots that we came from. You know, I was in Abilene a number of years ago. There's a college there called Hardin-Simmons. I noticed that they had a theological center called the Logsdon Center. Well, my mother's folks, my mother's maternal branch is from, uh, or the Logstons from Abilene. And I called my mother and I said, is, indeed, is this Logston Center and the fellow who donated it, Mr. Charles Wesley Logston, is he one of my relatives? And she assured me, yes, he is the, the uh, cousin of your great-grandfather, John Logston. I knew that. He said, this is your descendant or your progenitor, Mr. Charles Wesley Logston. And I immediately uh, made some phone calls. I wanted to get to know this wealthy, so this godly branch of my family. <coughs> Got to know them, and sure enough, I was proud of the fact those are my roots. The Logstons of West Texas helped donate that center. My wife, uh, her mother's side, were the Youngers that came um, from Arkansas unto Missouri. Just so happened she is a descendant of Cole and Bob Younger, the outlaws and bank robbers. <laughs> you can't ever tell when you shake your family tree what might fall out, you know. Well, this morning and for the mornings after this, so we're going to be looking not just at these big bedrock ideas that the church was built upon, like Augustinianism and different eyes like this we've been looking at, we're going to look at some stuff that may shake down out of your tree in the next few weeks. We have seen the Reformation geographically go from Germany to Switzerland at Zurich and Geneva, and now it will go to England. You've seen the arisal of the Lutherans in Germany, the Baptists in Switzerland, under Calvin, the Reformed faith that's going to be the basis of English Puritanism and Scottish Presbyterianism. So if you're a Baptist, a Lutheran, a Presbyterian, uh, we're into where you were, where you came from. We've also seen the arisal of, of the first great Reformation theologian, Mr. John Calvin, and his institutes of his putting into a formal document the Reformation doctrine primarily upon the sovereignty of God, that God predestines, calls, converts so uh, sovereignly by His grace, and keeps that person in grace unto eternity, that this church happens to believe. We are Calvinistic. We also saw that there's the first division within Protestantism on doctrine. Uh, the remonstrance movement in Holland under Jacob Arminius, and he felt man had a free will, that man did the choosing. That salvation was the cooperation between God providing Christ and man having the freedom to reject it or own his own come to that knowledge and him being able to lose it. And so now you begin to see even within Reformed theology, the Arminian view and the Calvinist, everyone in this room will fit into one of those two. Every single one of you. Whether you know what an Arminian is or a Calvinist, we happen to be Calvinistic in this church. A fellow put a note in our box last week and he said, I am an Arminian, DBC, deceived by Calvinism. Well, at least he knows where we're coming from. I never ever have grief over anyone who understands what I believe. So he knows where we're coming from. Well, I want to show you this week how the Reformation went to England. And this is kind of odd. The Reformation, in, we're going to look at it in England, and then we're going to look at the official end of the Reformation in 1648, when after the Thirty Years' War, Eng, uh, Protestants and Calvinists, or, or Protestants and, and Catholics, went to war, and they're going to officially allow religious toleration. You're going to have the Catholic counter-reformation where you will have both spiritual trying to reclaim lost ground, and they'll go to war. We're going to kill 35% of Germany 
in Catholics reclaiming Protestant lands. This is an area of history we don't study because at this time the Puritans are coming to, to New England and we leave Europe. But this is a very important thing. So we're going to see the Reformation in England. We'll see the Catholic counter-Reformation, both spiritually and militarily. And then we're going to see in England a strange thing. Now let me give you an overview. In Germany, Switzerland, and every place the Reformation goes through, you have a polarization. Protestants, Catholics, antipathy, anger, war takes place, except in England. And you're going to have this amalgam. It's not going to be a Protestant deal, and it's not going to be a Catholic deal. It's going to be a hybrid, a centaur, both man and animal coming together. The phenomena of the Anglican church that's not quite Catholic and not quite Protestant. And the Protestants of that country will not like it one whit, that there is not a polarity on the Protestant position. And they're going to do something that no Protestant did in Germany, none did in Geneva. They don't do anywhere primarily, but they're going to do it in England. 30,000 of them are going to leave that country. And they are going to end up on the shores of Virginia and of Plymouth and, and New England. And they will become the phenomena of America. Okay? Let me show you how the Reformation began. It's going to affect our country, the Reformation in England. This fellow, there is no fellow that is more farther from being a reformer than him. Charles Dickens called him a spot of blood and grease on the history of England. A sentiment that was echoed by Winston Churchill. Henry VIII was extremely immoral. He also happens to be a rabid uh, Catholic. He is given the title by the Pope, the Defensor Fide, the Defender of the Faith, because of his treatise against Martin Luther. He hates Protestants. The problem is, is that he and his wife, named Catherine of Spain, another zealous Catholic, Henry VIII and Catherine of Spain, she has given him five children. Four of them have died. The one that has lived is a girl named Mary. He does not want to die and to turn his kingship over to a woman. He doesn't want a queen after him. He wants a king. What he needs is a divorce. But that's not easy to get when you are a 16th century Catholic. What he does is he appeals to the Pope that the reason his children have died is because his family is under a curse. Because Catherine was formerly the wife of his brother Philip, and Philip died, and Henry took his brother's wife, and he feels that that was incest, and thus God has cursed his family. The Pope sees through it, and he says, no, you are to stay married to her. And so what Henry did is he simply invented his own religion. He found a 1300s law that said no English king can be in treaty with another country. He felt that the Pope was part of Italy, therefore he was violating English law. And so he issued what was called the Act of Supremacy, and he broke with the Catholic Church. He began his own church that was called the Church of England, or the Anglican Church, or we would call it the Episcopalian Church. And basically, it didn't have a pope, it had a king, Henry. And the head of the church, the spiritual aspect of the church, was the Archbishop of Canterbury, and his name is Thomas Cranmer. Remember that for later. And to placate the English people, he gave them the one thing they had been crying for. They wanted an English Bible. They spoke English, not Latin, the Latin Vulgate was no use to them. They wanted an English Bible. Years earlier, William Tyndale, have you ever heard that name? He translated the Latin into English and was burned at the stake. Henry VIII issued the Great Bible, an English Bible, and all England was appreciative. And they read, the Reformation sympathies were so high in England that they read the English Bible so much that Henry issued an edict that it was illegal to read the Bible unless you were a nobleman or a wealthy merchant. Can you imagine a country having to do that? Where the head of the country says, no Bible reading, please. So it begins here. When Henry dies, 
uh, this fellow named Edward VI. Now, don't remember these, don't try to remember these different kings. But what you're going to have here with Henry is a jump ball, just like in basketball, and the Catholics and the Protestants are going for this ball. Will the Church of England, that is essentially an English Catholic church, it holds to the priesthood, it has all the sacraments, Catholics and Protestants go for it to see who will get it. This fellow, Edward VI, he is the child of Henry and Anne Boleyn. I'm sorry, of Henry and... uh, Jane Seymour. Henry divorced Catherine. Yes, Jane Seymour. Also called Dr. Quinn. She was a young doctor. (laughs) Kidding. You wrote it down, didn't you? No, Henry takes Anne Boleyn. He gets rid of Catherine. He takes Anne Boleyn. We've made a movie about her called Anne of a Thousand Days. Made another movie called... uh, um, man for all seasons, a fellow resisted the divorce called Thomas More, and he had him beheaded. Well, Anne Boleyn couldn't give him any male child either. She just gave him a female named Elizabeth, and he didn't like that, so he charged her with incest and cut her head off, and he married Jane Seymour. Nice guy, Henry. He really is a spot of blood and grease on the history of England. But he marries Jane Seymour, and they had a sickly little child called Edward VI and never had a wife or a kid himself. He dies young, and he happened to be Calvinistic, and he authored the 42 articles, and they are Protestant. And it made the Anglican church swing Protestant. After he dies, there's no heir, and so this woman called Mary, she is the sole child of Catherine and Henry. The one kid that she could give him, and she's a fiery, zealous Spanish Catholic. She took every notable Protestant that had arisen during Edward's rule and put them to death. The most famous was Cranmer himself, the Archbishop of Canterbury. He had earlier recanted his Protestantism, and he recanted his recantation and said that he was indeed a Protestant. And when he was put to death, and here is a woodcut of him being burned at the stake, and you'll notice there is a fellow on his left. The fellow on his left, before the fires raise up, Offer him a scroll, and if he will take his right hand and sign that scroll, he will recant his Protestant belief of faith alone. And Cranmer takes the hand that he says, this is the hand that offendeth. And he takes his right hand and he puts it in the flames and he burns it off. Now, folks, that's hardcore Christianity. And Cranmer is killed. She receives the name Bloody Mary. And all of the Protestants of England flee to Calvin's Geneva. And there they see a model government of Protestants. And they come back when this woman comes to power, Elizabeth, the fiery red-headed daughter of Henry and Anne Boleyn. She is called the Virgin Queen, Good Queen Bess. As a matter of fact, Virginia, our Virginia, is named after this woman, the Virgin Queen. She is the woman that begins colonization over here in New England. Uh, She is a good politician. She gets right on the edge between Catholicism and Protestantism with what is called the Via Media, the middle way. She makes the articles, the 42 articles, she amends to 39, and they're Protestant. The liturgy of the church, the church service is Catholic. So if you went into that church, you couldn't tell the difference between that and Catholicism, but its doctrines were Protestant. It was a via media. All of the folks come back from Geneva that had fled under Mary and they protested. What they wanted was Calvin's Geneva. And we have a name for these men. They are called Puritans. You ever heard that name? Those within the Anglican Church of Elizabeth that protested any articles of Catholicism. I want you to realize these people of England were in a position that other Reformation people were not in. In Germany, you could be Lutheran. In Switzerland, you could be Zwinglian, or you could be Baptist, or you could be Reformed. But here, you're stuck in this hybrid called Anglicanism. Catholics don't like it. Protestants don't like it. And so these people wanted to purify any notion of Protestantism or of uh, Catholicism. 
Puritans. Remember that name. Well, after Elizabeth, this fellow. Elizabeth has no children, and so she, on her deathbed, suggests that James the Sixth of Scotland come down to London and from London rule the entire British Empire, and he changes his name from James the Sixth to James the First, the first king of the United Kingdom of Scotland and England. And all of the Puritans are excited because they're hoping that the Presbyterianism of John Knox's Scotland has rubbed off on him. The problem is they find out that this man is a raging homosexual. And he offends them deeply. They feel he is a sodomite king. He also believes in what is called the book of sport. The Puritans were Sabbatarians. You couldn't do anything on the Sabbath. They felt as Puritans they were the new Israel. And so on, uh, on Sunday they wouldn't do anything. This fellow had a book of what you could do. You could bowl. You could play around the maypole, you could play hide and seek, you could do all kinds of things, and that offended them. He also instituted an archbishop called William Laud that forced Catholic practices upon the Anglican Church. Preachers had to wear robes, you had to have silver candles, things like this. It would be the same, I want you to identify with this, you're a bunch of Protestants as Christians in this church. Suppose that you came in some Sunday, and I had a statue, a beautiful Renaissance statue right there, of the Assumption of Mary, of Mary being, according to Catholic tradition, assumed bodily into heaven and escaping death. What do you think the response would be? I'll promise you, I would have letters all that week by angered people in this church against my acquiescing to a Catholic notion. Suppose that during communion, we wouldn't let you take communion, but rather we had you file by the front, and I would take the bread, dip it in, and put it in your mouth. What would you think? I would get letters all week. You would respond the same. As a matter of fact, I'll assure you, if I put a painting over here of... uh, Francis of Assisi, I would get letters from a great many of you about a Catholic acquiescence in this church. Well, you can imagine being a Puritan and all of these Catholic ideas are put upon you. Under James I, you saw a phenomena. Are you ready? Something new that's precious to us. It's the reason you gain about five pounds every November. All right. You began to see a great number of English Puritans say, we're leaving. And a hundred of them, and they were called pilgrims. They were the radical fringe of English Puritanism. Pilgrims got together and they went to Leyden, Holland, and they began a new Israel. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. They were going to begin a new country, a city set on a hill, the new Israel of God, that they felt that was their responsibility to build. They didn't hold to a separation of church and state. They, as Puritans, wanted to provide the leaders that would be the state, and you had kind of a Catholic Christendom, but it was under Protestant doctrine. Phenomenal idea. Well, when they were in Holland, their children quit speaking English, began to speak Dutch. And there were some more liberal ways in Holland that they didn't like. And so what they did is they looked at a new movement that was beginning. Now here's what was happening. Under Elizabeth, she had found that there was this great country, that had, the new world that had come back from about, oh, 80 years earlier, that we'd called America. Uh, the French were going to the north, and they were bringing back furs. The Catholics were going to the south, and they were bringing back gold. Well, right along this middle coastland in the New World, they had begun to grow something. She had sent a fellow over there. You ready? Sir Walter Raleigh. There's a name you know. And they found that they could grow two things that were hits in England. One of them you could wear, and one of them you could smoke it, and it'd make you crazy. One of them was called cotton. And that was a new idea. They liked that. And the other one is they found that all up and down the coast, they could grow this phenomena called tobacco. 
and it was a rage throughout all of England. And you would take this weed, and you would crush it up, and you would put it in what was called a pipe. And you would smoke this pipe, and it would make your body do those strange, exotic things that happen to you when you ingest nicotine. And that's why all up and down you have these places that were settled, like Marlboro, uh, and Kent, and Salem, uh, Raleigh, Lucky Strike, just kidding. <laughs> you wrote it down, nah, come on. Yeah, they, that's where, they were tobacco growing places. Well, these Puritans, these English Puritans, they said, let's just leave the whole of this continent. Let's go over there. And they found them a boat, very famous name, called the Mayflower. And about a hundred of them boarded that boat and they came. But it was not to be an English colony. As a matter of fact, in the charter of the Mayflower, the pilgrims left out any notion that they were an English colony. They, in essence, renounced English citizenship. They came to be a Christian nation. They were not going to send anything back. They came for the purpose, not of colonization, not for tobacco, not for anything. They wanted to worship and to worship freely. They did not believe in toleration. There was a famous case at this time called the Henry Childs case, where a Presbyterian doctor in Massachusetts was not allowed to vote because he was a Presbyterian. So they held that you had to believe in theirs to be part of their little entity. Well, only a hundred came until this fellow. And with him, you have what is called the swarming of the Puritans between 20 and 30,000 of England's best picked up and left because of this fellow. He is a rabid Catholic and he does the unthinkable. Can you imagine if our president in an act of power, dismissed the House and the Senate, and he would run the country himself. What do you think we would do? We would have an impeachment before we had a lynching. And our country has only been constitutional for 200 years. England had been constitutional since 1215. Do you remember that test question that we all forgot after the eighth grade? King John at Runnymede, England, on the banks of the Thames, was forced by English lords to sign that charter whereby he absolved himself of tyranny. There was law outside of him that he had to honor certain liberties. And what do we call that, that document? Do you remember? The Magna Carta, the basis of Western constitutional law, that kings are not law. The law is king. That man dismissed parliament and what they had was a war. And we never study this. But England divided up between Catholics that followed after Charles and not and parliament or um, loyal Englishmen that followed after Charles. And then 20,000 Puritans went to war with this fellow. His name is Oliver Cromwell, and he has a group of men called the Parliamentarians. They're also called uh, the Roundheads because they had very short haircuts. That's the way you could tell them. And the Roundheads and the Royalists went to war, and to make a long story short, Cromwell defeated Charles and had him beheaded. This is a very famous part of American history in a speech by Mr. Patrick Henry. Caesar had his Brutus and Charles I his Cromwell. And they put him to death. And then they established a Puritan government at Westminster. And that is why about every third Protestant church is named, or Presbyterian church, is named Westminster. But he started a Puritan government. And do you know what? It failed. Failed miserably. Because Christians were now asked to do something that Christians can't do real well. They were asked to get along. Let me tell you something about Christians. We're generally wonderful at splitting. We're just not too good at building anything. We're marvelous at revolutions. We're just not real good at building things. 
Congress. It's a whole lot easier to have a revolution than it is to have a constitution. Do you know that? Ask the French, ask the Russians, ask the Americans at 1787 at Philadelphia. None of the revolutionaries were there. A whole lot easier to behead a king than to draw up a, a constitution. Presbyterian Congress... Uh, Puritans couldn't get along with congregational Puritans. Uh, Oliver Cromwell didn't do such a good job. As a matter of fact, his name is vilified today in Scotland and in Ireland. He marched on them. And so what they did was they called back the monarchy. Would you please come back and rule us? And William and Mary came from Scotland, and the monarchy was established with Parliament, and that grand experiment ended. Well... After this, I want to show you this just briefly. No one ever studies this. The Catholics did not give up their land very easily. You had a spiritual movement with this fellow. His name, and I put it wrong on your sheet, his name is not Francis Loyola. It is Ignatius. How many of you have ever heard of Catholic colleges called Loyola? Or high schools called Loyola? This was a... a Spanish military man that was hit in the leg by a cannonball and it shattered his leg. And while he was recuperating, he had a mystical religious experience at Manresa. And it said that he left a different man. He forsook his military and he became a rabid follower of the Pope. And his job was to bring Europe back from the Reformation to Mother Church. He got a thousand men who, and I quote him, whether to the Turks or to the New World or to the Lutherans or to others, whether they be infidel or faithful, they would go at the behest of the Pope. And they were called the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits. Now, how many of you have ever heard of a Jesuit? Uh, my son played in Dallas at the finest baseball field in Dallas that was Dallas Jesuit. And so this rabid group of Catholic zealots is still around today. Catholic Jesuits. There was something else that happened that was called the Council of Trent. In 1545, the Catholic Church drew a line in the sand in Europe, and they made an official council. Here is a slide of the Council at Trent. They all came together, and here was the statement, among other statements. Whosoever believes that one is saved by faith alone, apart from any work, he shall be anathema. And they took Reformation doctrine and they cast them as anathema. And so from that point, if you were a Catholic and you entered into that belief, you were removed from the Catholic Church. Make no bones, my friends. In our country, we tend to have a filial relationship between Protestants and Catholics. Well, it was not so early on. Rome has always been adamantly opposed to the notion of salvation by faith alone in Jesus Christ. Council of Trent. After that... You saw a Jesuit called Francis Xavier. This fellow went out to begin new Catholic lands. And do you know where he went? This Catholic went to India and established Catholicism. He went to um, Malaya and established Catholicism. He went to China and established Catholicism. He went to Japan. He went farther than any missionary since the Apostle Paul to establish Catholicism. Still today, we have Xavier College, Xavier High Schools, Xavier uh, Hospitals. He was a marvelous missionary. He also had a fellow that was a Spanish counterpart that went to the West and down in Mexico, a fellow named Bartolomeu de las Casas baptized one million Mexicans into the Catholic Church. The reason that Mexico is Catholic today was this one man's work, Bartholomew de las Casas. And then you had the phenomena. And this was an ugly thing, the Thirty Years' War. We have one on that? The Thirty Years' War... Catholics and Protestants went at it from 1618 to 648. They killed 35% of Europe and of Germany. 
A kid born at that time knew that someday he had to go to war against Italy, and he didn't know why. Uh, it was at this time you had a couple of inventions that made war a vile thing. Up until then, you had sabers. In the Thirty Years' War, you had the invention of a phenomena that was called gunpowder, and you could take a long iron cylinder and you could ignite it with a flash pan and you could cause an explosion in that cylinder and you could send out a rifle ball. And this thing could go 60 yards on a deadline and you could tear a man in half with a rifle ball. It was known as a rifle. And you would take those cylinders and you would bring rifling to them so that that thing would... If it was a bullet, would stay nice and even later on, and it became an ugly science in the artillery. You had a fellow called Gustavus Adolphus that no longer did you just have cannons that would fire shell and shot onto fortresses. He rigged it to where you could get little cannons, hook them to the cavalry, haul them behind horses, turn them, and you could turn them on men and upon cavalry. And this is where you began to see the dismemberment of bodies by cannon shot. And it was ugly. And by 1648, there was no winner. 1648 is a big event in Western history. This is called the Peace of Westphalia. They came to Holland and they simply said, this thing has got to stop. We'll let whoever has the region have the religion, and Spain, Italy, Portugal, they stay Catholic. The Netherlands, northern Germany, uh, France stays Catholic. Uh, the, the, all the others stay Protestant. Switzerland becomes Protestant. And you had the Peace of Westphalia. This is a stamp that was put out last year. And it is in memory of those men that brought about the end of the bloodiest war in Europe until World War I. And it is so bloody that as we're going to study next week, the majority of Europe had no credibility in Christianity after this war. Any belief that would bring such dismemberment and violence and death, they wanted nothing of it. At the Peace of Westphalia, you have what is called religious toleration, and you have now the arisal of what are called denominations. Well, you got five minutes. Remember those fellows that came to New England called Puritans? You now have 30,000 of them all up and down the coast. And this is our roots. These people considered themselves the new Israel. I wish I had more than about five minutes to show you this. This is my favorite part. The grand experiment of the Puritans. It is so phenomenal to me that after Westphalia, the notion of Christendom is over. It's the, I want you to realize the impact. Since 312 A.D., under Rome, you have had church working with empire to impose Christianity on Europe. Church and state are, are one double-edged sword. From 1648, this is the first time since the 4th century A.D. that you have the phenomena of no empire imposing itself on Christianity. Each state has a church. The Lutherans of Sweden... The Lutherans of the areas of Germany, um, the Anglicans of England, but you don't have a Christendom. The last notion of Christendom is going to come from these people, these English Puritans. When they left England, they said to England, goodbye Babylon, goodbye Rome. They were the new Israel and they called their leaders Joshua and Caleb. They felt that the Indians... The Mohawks, the Huron, the Iroquois, they didn't call them Indians. They called them Canaanites. And they felt they were to do to the Indian like David did to the Philistine, to establish in Canaan the city of God. They were strong Calvinists. They were Calvinistic in their doctrine. 
And uh, let me tell you something interesting about him. How many of you have ever heard of Fox's Book of Martyrs? You ever heard of that? That was the most widely published book in England. And in Fox's Book of Martyrs, Mr. Fox translated the martyrdom of the godly all the way down to Bloody Mary that came to rest on the shores of Europe or of England. And it was felt by the Puritan that they stood in the line of God's grace from all the way from David down through the Reformation into Bloody Mary that they were responsible for the nation of God. And so when they came to America... It was not to grow tobacco merely and cotton. These people came for theological reasons. They were wrong in their theology. But let me tell you, in the nobility of what they believed, here's what it was. They believed in what was called covenant. That when a Puritan baby was born, he was baptized into that community. He was raised in literacy and Bible. The Puritans had a law called the Old Deluder Satan Act. And if you had a city of 50 people or more, you were forced by Puritan law to have a school. Because they felt that you could not be wise in the law of God unless you presuppose literacy. Every Puritan child had to read. They began a college right after they began here called Harvard that was to educate Puritan ministers. And every boy at Harvard had to read in the Greek every day meditations on the scripture and account to his overseer there in that college that he was growing in piety. Now, that's what they believe. They're going to set up a new nation. Now, let me put it in easy terms so that you can understand it. If I were to come to you and say that we're going to begin a new country, America has become so corrupt, we're going to begin a new country. We're going to give you New Zealand, areas of New Zealand that have not been colonized. How would you do it? Let me tell you what you'd do. You would go handpick the best you knew of these congregations. You would make a covenant with them this, just before you landed. And that compact, that covenant would be that you would protect that community and any child born into it would be baptized and he would be a Puritan. And then you would wait later in his life. He would attend church, he would learn until he had had an experience. The Puritans believed in what was called a testimony. The notion to them that you were born into the faith was obnoxious. The idea that you were born a Christian was obnoxious. You had to have what they called experimental religion. You had to give them a testimony that you had been converted. You had to be very delineating on how you were converted. And if you couldn't, then you could not hold office, you could not own property, and you could not vote. All you could do would be to attend church. Couldn't take communion, but you could attend church. And that's what you would do. You would have kids. You would bring them to faith. They would become the state. They would become the landowners. They would become the politicians. And you have now, it sounds a lot like Catholicism of the Middle Ages, but it was Protestant. You had the city of God, Calvin's Geneva. That was their dream. They did not believe in religious toleration. They believed in freedom that was their freedom. Lord love them. But that's what they held. Look good? You think it'd work? Everybody believes the same? Keep having them babies. Keep having them babies. Keep having them babies. Bring them on in. Get them converted. Get them in the church. Let them take positions of leadership. We move those boundaries outward. Keep having babies. Keep having them babies. Bring them into the church, go up to leadership, get married, keep having them babies. You see what happens? We're going to take over the world. Why didn't it work? Teenagers. <laughs> you think I'm joking? Teenagers. 
All those little babies that were born into the covenant, they were going to wait to get converted and then they could hold office and they could get married and they could have more kids and build the nation of God and the city set on the hill and we could have Christian empire on the world and we could continue the line of grace begun from Israel on. Well, those kids grew up and they looked kind of sinful. They began to get their hands on a little white lightning and began to do some things that were kind of immoral. And lo and behold, these kids that we brought up don't show any evidence of conversion. They had to compromise. Did you hear what I said? A Puritan had to compromise. They had what was called the halfway covenant, that the kid could be born into the faith, go to church, he could hold office, he could own land, but he couldn't take communion because he couldn't give evidence that he was saved. Well... That's the halfway covenant. You know what happened after that? It's the death of the Puritan dream. There was a couple of families that had some daughters that got a hold of a Haitian slave. And her name was Tatuba. And she taught them voodoo. And a witch scare went out. And these girls, and there was some weird things that happened. But these girls would begin identifying who in the community there at Salem were witches. Do you know how the Puritans, they began to hold trials for witchcraft. And the way that you could know that you were a witch is they would immerse you in water. If you drowned, you weren't a witch. (laughs) If they held you under for about five minutes and they raised you up and you were alive, it was because you were a witch. They put to death, I can't remember the exact number, I think it was like 20 women, a couple of men, and a dog. Burned him at the stake. Well, what happened was that everybody laughed at him, and the Puritan dream ended. Why? Because you can't legislate conversion. I'm sorry but you can't do it. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it and you don't know where it comes from, where it is going, so is everyone who's born of the Spirit. They rebelled against their own Calvinism. You, now, the, you know what the vestige is of the Puritans today? It's in 20th century evangelical Protestants. You can have your kid, you can homeschool him, you can keep him from demon TV and everything you want to. But the fact is that kid has to encounter a sovereign act of grace and you can do all that you can, but you have no assurance of us building a nation of God by your kids. Very good parents can have some very bad kids. What's the solution? 1 Corinthians 7, where Paul tells you to be single because you'll have trouble in this world and I'm trying to spare you. The Catholics tried it. The Puritans tried it. I'm sorry, you can't do it. You cannot go to Tasmania, to North Carolina, or any place else and begin you a holy Christian community of kids born into your faith to get converted later and you begin the nation of God, New Salem. I'm sorry. So by 17 or 1692, the Puritan dream was over. What have we looked at? The shattering of papal authority. Are you with me? We've seen it. It's fallen. We saw the counter-reformation of 30 years war. Nothing happened. They came to the peace of Westphalia. And you have the phenomena in 1648 of religious toleration. And now the rise of what are called Baptist, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Anglicans, Mennonites, Amish, the Hutterites that were Baptist. And here in a little bit, there's going to be a spinoff of the Anglicans known as a Methodist. And we're going to continue to see the phenomena of sects or denominations. By the 1700s, the colonies had been inundated by the phenomena of deism because Europe is going to punt Christianity because of the violence and the horridness of war that they had seen. You're going to have the beginning of the age of reason. Reason will not serve Scripture anymore. Harvard is compromised. You know why Yale was begun? Because Harvard went deistic. We'll see it next week. And America is going to need, by the 1700s, a fresh wind. And that fresh wind will be what is called the Second Reformation of Pietism, 
with the phenomena of revival, and listen to what's going to happen, one-tenth of America is under, going to undergo conversion, and they're going to find out that you can do it. A church can support itself financially and materially without the government's intervention. And so you will have then the possibility of a state and a church that is self-supported with the state not messing with it because by the great awakening you will find out that churches can run themselves. And you will have, in 1787, the phenomena of the United States of America. Be here next week and I'll show you how it happened. Our Father, we thank you that all through the fallibilities, the ignorance, the errors, the violence, the wickedness of men, that you have sovereignly preserved the essence of thy word. It has become frayed and entangled by us, for indeed we see in a mirror dimly. But you have overcome, Lord, not merely Satan, not merely death, but you have even overcome your own people to preserve the purity of Jesus. And we pray as we continue our studies that the blessedness of the Bible, the sufficiency of grace, the adequacy of his conversion, might be indeed precious to us. And with an eye to the past, we might be wise in our day, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.